Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is technically solved, but a lot of people think that there is more to this story than what we see at the surface. There is a lot to go over, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody's thoughts are on this case after hearing the details. But with that being said, let's just jump right into it. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic murder of Amanda Blackburn. Amanda Blackburn was born on July 31st, 1987 in Muskegon, Michigan. She started schooling in Indianapolis, Indiana before she moved to Acker, Indiana in 1995 with her family. She went on to graduate from Alcourt Christian Academy in 2006, then went on to Pensacola Christian College in Pensacola, Florida, graduating with her associate's degree in 2008. Then Amanda went on to meet a man named Davy Blackburn. She actually met him on a blind date that was set up by a mutual friend where they went to go see a Christian band called Hawk Nelson, and by August 1st, 2008, the couple got married. Before getting married, the two of them had been dating long distance for a few years, and they were really only able to spend time together for bouts of about three weeks at a time. They went to different colleges at the time, so they really only got to see one another on school breaks. So when they got married, of course, they had some things that they needed to work through, such as how to communicate with one another. They did go to counseling for this, and things seemed to be going really great for them. Amanda was described as being an amazing person with a huge heart. She was someone who brought joy to her family. Her mother described that Amanda was a gift from day one. She said that Amanda never gave her any trouble growing up or when she was an adult. Those who knew Davy said that Amanda was the piece of Davy that had been missing. She literally completed him. Amanda and Davy were absolutely devoted to their faith. After getting married, Davy and Amanda lived in South Carolina, where Davy worked as an assistant pastor at New Spring Church. By 2012, they went on to move back to Indianapolis, where they opened the Resonant Church, which was a church tailored to young people. They talked a lot of relationship advice, conflict resolution, and things like that. Soon after getting married, the couple went on to have their first son, Weston. Amanda was described as being a doting, dedicated mother. She was nurturing, loving, and she loved cuddling with her baby boy. Soon after that, when Weston was about nine months old, Amanda became pregnant with their second child. However, everything in their lives changed in the worst possible way on November 10th, 2015. According to Davy, he left the home that he shared with his wife at around 6 a.m. that morning to go work out at the LA Fitness while Amanda stayed home and asleep. He said that when he left, he left the front door unlocked as he normally did when he left for the gym in the morning. He did his workout and then left the gym about an hour later at 7.10 a.m. As he was driving home, he said that he was talking on the phone with a friend. When he got home at around 7.30 a.m., he was still on the phone with this friend. He sat in the driveway, so in his car in the driveway talking on the phone, saying that he didn't want to go inside and wake Amanda and Weston up by talking, so he stayed in the car and talked on the phone. He finally entered his home at around 8.20 a.m. after the conversation was over. However, when he walked through the front door, he saw that 28-year-old Amanda was laying face down on the living room floor. She was partially nude with her underwear next to her and her shirt pulled up over her head as if someone was trying to take it off of her and she was lying in a pool of blood. Of course, he immediately worried about the well-being of their 15-month-old son, Weston, so he ran upstairs to his room and thankfully, Davy found Weston still in his crib, completely unharmed. Immediately, he called 911 to report that his wife had been harmed. When police arrived to the scene, Amanda was still alive, but barely. They tried their resuscitation efforts, and they took her to the hospital. Also, upon arriving to the scene, police noticed that Amanda's credit cards and wallet were on the floor. 
Her purse was on the kitchen counter, but they also found a Swisher Sweet cigar package on the counter as well. David said that this was not something that should have been in the house because neither of them smoked and especially not cigars. They also noticed that a decorative lamp had also been knocked over in the living room right next to where Amanda was found. Again, like I said, Amanda was still alive when she was found. She was 12 weeks pregnant at this time, and even though there was never an official test done, Davy said that they were so sure that the baby would have been a girl, they said that they were going to name her Everett or Evie for short. Either way, Amanda was rushed to the hospital and placed on life support to hopefully save the life of Amanda and her unborn baby. However, that next day on November 11th, she was taken off life support and she died and so did her unborn child. When Davy initially called 911, he reported that she had a head wound because he actually thought that she had been struck in the head with something. However, upon autopsy examination, it was found that Amanda had been shot three times. One time to her lower left arm, once in her upper back, and then one shot to the back of her head. Her manner of death was ruled a homicide, and her cause of death was determined to be the result of a gunshot wound to the back of her head. Her autopsy also found that she had scratches to her left cheek, her lip had been split and one of her lower teeth had been knocked out. After finding Amanda's body, of course, the police went ahead and searched the home for evidence. They took DNA swabs of the blood that was found around Amanda's body and other areas from Amanda's body, including under her fingernails and then also areas around the house. They found change lying on the floor, they found a roll of duct tape, and earphones lying on the floor in the living room near where Amanda was found. They also found a bullet at the scene, including one bullet hole at the base of the stairs and then a lead bullet under the stairs. They also found two bullets in Amanda, one in her upper arm, so in her bicep area, and then one in her head when they completed the autopsy. They found that the caliber was either a 38 or a 9 millimeter, and they found no shell casings at the scene, which could be indicative of a revolver being used. Then police found Amanda's cell phone in her bedroom, and they noticed that she had gotten an email at 7.53 a.m. from Chase Bank to alert her that her Chase debit card had alerted them to suspicious activity. Someone had used her card to withdraw money from an ATM. When investigators looked through her credit and debit cards in her wallet, they found that the Chase card was missing, indicating that it had been stolen. This raised a red flag for investigators because as it turned out that morning, two other people in the same area that Amanda and Davy had lived in called 911 to report burglaries that same morning. So by 5.23 a.m. on November 10th, a neighbor called 911 to report a burglary at her apartment. In this report, the neighbor stated that she woke up at 4.30 a.m. to realize that her cell phone was missing from her bedroom. When she got up, she saw that the sliding glass door to her apartment was open and all of the plants in her apartment were knocked over. She noticed that her Apple MacBook laptop was missing and so were her purse and her keys. Then she noticed that her car was missing from the apartment parking lot. When police responded to the call, they looked at the surveillance camera from the apartment's interior of the building, which took still shots of someone entering the residence. They saw shots of three people entering the apartment. Two of them were definitely seen entering, while they think the third one may have stood outside of the door of the apartment or he may have entered, but they just didn't see it on the still shot. They also found that the robbers made entry into the apartment by cutting the screen on the porch and then opening the sliding glass door. Then the robbers disabled the camera during the actual robbery itself. Then by 8.17 a.m. on November 10th, another neighbor, now one who lived on the same street as Amanda and Davey, they called 911 to also report a burglary. This neighbor also had security camera footage, but the camera had been disabled at 5.36 a.m. This robber also made entry by cutting the screen on the porch and then somehow unlocking the deadbolt on the sliding glass door. And for this robbery, these robbers went ham. 
They took four televisions, a MacBook Pro, a Tiffany Pearl necklace, a pink woman's sweatshirt, a universal AT&T remote controller, a bag of oranges, and bed sheets. Don't know why they took all of those things. But investigators also noted that it appeared that the robbers drank beer and wine in the house and left those empty bottles in the home. Then they exited the house through the front door. Now, I believe the woman in this situation was not home at the time of the robbery because it was said that when she returned home, she noticed that the front door was unlocked. So, I think that's why they were able to sort of spend so much time in the apartment and chill and drink beer and steal all of those things. This is a little bit off topic, but it always just gets me when robbers will just stay in one place for a long time to chill. When I was in high school, right after I'd gotten my own car, my house got broken into and my mom always left her purse on the kitchen table with her car keys in it. So they came in and took her car keys and stole her car. At the time, I had my car, a 1999 Nissan Altima, and I had always had my keys in my room. So my car luckily was not stolen, but I was not the most responsible, so sometimes I left my car door unlocked with my wallet inside. I actually had two wallets, so again, I was in high school at the time, so this wallet just had all of like my gift cards and things like that, half of which were empty or had like two bucks left on them, and then my real debit card and my ID and my cash were all kept in a different wallet in my purse, which I always had with me, I guess all the gift cards and stuff that I collected over time just didn't fit in my wallet, so I had it in a different wallet in the car. I don't know. Anyways, after my mom discovered that her car was stolen, I went in my car and found that the front driver's seat had been reclined all the way back, so someone was laying in the driver's seat of my car, and then my wallet had clearly been opened and rifled through, but again, all my gift cards were pretty much empty, so anything that they took they really didn't get much off of me. But the thing that got me was that I found orange cracker crumbs all over my seat. So I always kept those orange peanut butter crackers in my car because I always wanted a snack. I still do them the same way. I always could use a snack. But those were gone and the wrapper was still there and there were crumbs everywhere. So the same dude who stole my mom's car also went in my car, laid down, went through my wallet, and then ate my crackers while chilling in the car. Then they proceeded to take my mom's car. It's just a crazy story and it always just gets me when thieves and robbers just like, I'm gonna rob this place, but I'm also gonna chill. I'm gonna take my time. I'm gonna eat some snacks. I'm gonna drink some beer, drink some wine, and then I'll leave. It's just the audacity. But anyways, let's get back to the case. After these 911 calls were made, the next emergency call was to report that Amanda had been seriously injured and was laying on the living room floor. So, police went around the neighborhood to ask the different residents if they had seen any suspicious behavior that day, and they did find a few who had. So, one neighbor reported that just before 7 a.m. that morning, they saw a male dressed in all black with a hoodie over his head walking in front of her house. Another witness described saying the same thing, seeing him walking down the street, talking loudly on the phone, but this witness said that he had a t-shirt pulled up over his face. Then, by 7.10 a.m., another witness saw a late model Chrysler Sebring drive up and stop next to the man. The man then got into the car in the front passenger seat before the car backed into a driveway and drove away. This car and the man getting in were captured on this neighbor's surveillance camera. Then another witness came forward to the police to tell them that she was laying in bed that morning and sometime between 6.40 and 6.45 a.m., she heard what sounded like two shots and then a woman screaming. Then the police did go to the local LA Fitness to confirm whether or not Davey was there when he said he was, and they did confirm that his alibi checked out. By November 11th, police were alerted to reports of finding the stolen Chrysler Sebring. I actually don't remember if I mentioned it earlier, but the first neighbor who woke up and saw that her car was missing, it was this car, it was the Chrysler Sebring. I believe that it was located on the side of the road nearby where the car was stolen from, about pretty close to where Amanda's home was. 
Police took the car and with the owner's permission, they went ahead and searched it. They found that there was an ATM receipt on the front passenger side floor, which showed a denied attempt at taking out a $500 transaction at 6.36 a.m. on November 10th. The last four digits of the card used on the ATM receipt matched Amanda's stolen debit card. So it seemed that Amanda was harmed almost immediately after Davy left for the gym that morning because, again, they had already broken in and taken her debit cards and went to the ATM about a half hour after he left. So they must have broken in pretty soon after he left. Either way, in the car, they also found a pink woman's sweater on the floor on the driver's side, which was confirmed to belong to the woman who reported a pink sweater being missing. They found that Universal AT&T remote in the trunk of the car as well, and then they found a green men's XXL sweatshirt, a bed sheet, and a bag of oranges in the trunk as well. DNA swabs were taken from the sweater as well as from various areas inside of the car. Then, using the information of the location of the ATM that Amanda's debit card was used at, police went to that ATM and got video surveillance from it. On the video, they saw someone who appeared to be driving a silver Chrysler Sebring. They saw the person go up to the ATM with a pink shirt wrapped around his face and then wearing a white hoodie on his head. He was also wearing a dark colored vest. The footage showed the failed attempt at taking out $500 again at 6.36 a.m., but then another ATM located nearby shows the same person successfully taking out $400 from the account at 6.54 a.m. Now, like I said, police had taken DNA from the pink sweater that the woman reported missing that morning. Well, they sent the DNA off for testing through CODIS, and by November 17th, they got a match. This match belonged to a 21-year-old man named Jalen Watson. Jalen had just gotten out of prison on August 6th after completing a sentence for burglary, and he was on parole at that time. Then, going through Facebook searches, they also found that Jalen was associated with a 24-year-old man named Deano Gordon, who was also on parole for burglary. Then, they used their phone numbers to look through the location data on the morning of November 10th. That morning, both phone numbers pinged off of towers that followed the sequence of the robberies. At the time of the first robbery, starting at 4.40 a.m., their phone pinged off of the tower nearest that first home. Same thing with the second robbery and for the time that Amanda was believed to have been murdered, which was at 6.25 a.m. Then the pings followed where the stolen debit card was used. First, at 6.39 a.m., it showed their phones pinging to the closest tower to that ATM. Then, at 6.54 a.m., their phones pinged closest to the ATM where someone successfully took out $400. Then, if you think back to that person that other witnesses saw walking around that same morning in the neighborhood, their phones also indicate that they were in that same area around that same time. Then, police looked at who Jalen was communicating with that morning, and they found another phone number that belonged to an 18-year-old teenager named Larry Taylor Jr. Larry Taylor also had a criminal history, including misdemeanor charges of public nudity and indecency after he exposed himself to a woman in a parking lot. So then police went and found out a number that Jalen had once given his parole board, and that number belonged to his sister. Police went ahead and spoke with the sister, who told police that Jalen, Diano, and Larry were all at her apartment on the night before the burglaries. She told the police that the three of them left her home at 3.30 a.m. the morning of November 10th. In her closet, police found a black vest, which the sister said belonged to her boyfriend, but Jalen liked to wear it as well. Then she said that on the morning of November 10th, one of these three was wearing that dark vest, which, as we heard from before, is consistent with something that a man was seen wearing by a witness. Then the sister gave police a 9mm pistol that either Jalen or Diano had brought to her apartment and left under her bed. Then police found another witness who provided them information as a confidential informant, so we don't know the identity of this person, but this person told the police that Larry, Jalen, and Diano left the apartment that morning while Larry was carrying his 38 revolver. 
The informant said that he was possibly wearing a dark vest at the same time. This person described how Larry climbed into that first apartment where they stole the woman's phone and her car keys while she was asleep. The men found out that they were on video, so that is when they disabled the cameras. After taking the phone and the car, the CI said that Larry actually said that he wanted to kill the woman because he was seen on camera, but the person said that Jalen and Diano convinced Larry to leave. So, they all left together in the Sebring. According to the CI, they wanted more money, so they drove to a nearby subdivision where they broke into the next home. The three men all entered this home this time and stole all of the items that we discussed earlier. But after that, the group decided that they still wanted more. So, according to the CI, the group went to Amanda's home on foot. The CI said that only Larry and Jalen went inside while Deanna waited in the Sebring, which was parked in the driveway. A short time later, apparently, Jalen came out to the car and told Diano that Larry just busted a woman's mouth with a gun. He said that Jalen tried to get Larry to leave, but Larry went outside and threw some debit cards in the car, and I guess he went back inside of the home. Then, Jalen and Diano left to go to different ATMs before they got that $400. After that, Jalen and Diano considered leaving Larry at the house, but Larry said that he would kill the woman if they left him. So, they went back to the house to pick up Larry before they drove to the other neighborhood to drop off the car where it was later found. After that, the three met up at another apartment, I believe either where his sister lived, but I'm not 100% sure, it could have been somewhere else. Either way, that was where Larry had told Diano and Jalen that he had actually murdered the woman that they were robbing. He told them that the woman charged at him, so he shot her somewhere in her upper body so that he wouldn't be scratched. Then he said that when she fell down after he shot her, he leaned over her body and shot her in the back of the head. He said that he then leaned over further, looked at her face, and watched her bleed. I guess he wanted to confirm that she died or something like that, but that is just a whole nother really messed up aspect to this. Of course, the cell phone data pings all show where these men were at the times of the robberies and the murder, but this CI was able to tell investigators pretty much exactly how this whole thing went down and was able to say who at least claimed to have been the one who pulled the trigger. So, Larry ended up being charged with 13 charges, including murder, burglary, criminal confinement while armed with a deadly weapon, and robbery resulting in serious bodily injury. Jalen faced 10 charges of murder, burglary, robbery, resulting in serious bodily injury, and auto theft. Deanna was also charged with burglary and theft, and he was later charged with murder as well. Then it came out that Larry was also allegedly involved with the shooting death of another man. The body of 27-year-old Rolando Gonzalez Hernandez was found next to his car at his apartment complex after he had been shot in the head. Witnesses told authorities that Larry admitted to them that he robbed and shot someone at the apartment complex where Rolando was later found. He told the witnesses that he, quote, robbed and shot a Mexican and found $10 in his wallet. That took place on November 4th, a week before Amanda was murdered. Then, he allegedly told another witness that he broke into the home of another woman and raped her at gunpoint. Now, with Amanda's murder, as we know, she was found half-nude with her underwear next to her and her shirt pulled up. However, according to investigators, they said that they couldn't find any conclusive evidence of her actually being raped or sexually assaulted. So, they weren't able to charge him with anything relating to sexually assaulting Amanda. But after all of that, Jalen also faced charges for two murders now, rape for the other woman who he admitted to, and the burglaries of the other homes on the morning of November 10th. The process of getting the plea deals, getting to the trial, all of that actually took quite a while, but after two years, two to three years, I believe, Diano and Jalen ended up taking plea deals in exchange for testifying against Larry at his bench trial, 
and for that, the charges of murders were dropped for them. So, Jalen was handed a sentence of 29 years in prison, while Deanna was sentenced to 30 years. Larry's first trial for Amanda's murder didn't take place until December of 2021. During this trial, I guess his defense attorney successfully argued to not tell the jury about Amanda's unborn baby, which I really don't understand since a baby died because of his actions and initially he was charged for that death, but I guess not. I guess it's not relevant. But either way, during that first trial, jurors actually found out that she was pregnant when she was killed, so the judge ordered a mistrial, I guess because it would make the jury more sympathetic, which they should be. They should be because he took the life of a woman and a baby, but that's a whole nother conversation. The second trial took place in June of 2022. However, this trial was also declared as a mistrial because apparently several jurors found out about the first mistrial and they had been discussing that information with one another. So then finally, the third trial for Amanda's murder took place in October of 2022. The evidence they relied on was the testimony from Deano and Jalen, the cell phone data, and other witness accounts. And by September of 2022, a verdict was reached. Larry Taylor was found guilty of murder, one level one felony burglary, two level four felony burglaries, two counts of theft, criminal confinement, auto theft, and carrying a handgun without a license. To this, he was sentenced to 86 years behind bars. And I do believe that Larry was not ever convicted of the other murder and rape as far as I have been able to see. I don't think he ever went to trial. I don't know if they're just not able to find enough evidence beside the witness testimony, which if that's all they do have, then I can see why it's difficult to take it to trial. But as far as I know, he's only in jail for the things related to those other burglaries as well as to Amanda's murder. That is normally where I would end most cases. However, with this case, some people think that there is more to this case than a situation of a random home invasion that ended in murder. Some people think that Davey is suspicious and that he may even have some sort of involvement. Some people even think that he ordered the execution of his wife. Now, I will discuss some of the information that has led people to this conclusion. First, a lot of people think that just after Amanda's death, Davey sort of jumped on the opportunity to make money off of the tragedy, to capitalize off of it. A lot of the information that I will tell you is either rumored or circumstantial, and any allegations are just alleged. That is what I want to say from the get-go, in case I forget to say it throughout. None of this, or at least most of it, is not confirmed, just allegations or rumors. But with that, let's talk about it. So the first thing that people from Amanda's family have said is that just two months before Amanda's murder, Davy took out a sizable life insurance policy on her. So the amount of time that he had to wait before it took effect was eight weeks. And almost right after it took effect, Davy got that life insurance policy and he benefited from it big time. Now, some people might say it was because she was pregnant with their second child, so they took out the insurance policy right after they found out that she was pregnant again. That could be possible, but it also was right before this murder, right before she died, so that's a really big red flag to a lot of people. Another thing that people find odd is some of the statements that he made after the murder. Now, I will get more into this later, but Davey runs a blog, a podcast, and all different forms of media. He has a website. He writes posts about his own life, advice columns, and everything about faith and things like that. He puts on sermons. He does different talks. He, you know, goes on tours, things like that. So the first statement that he made was just hours after Amanda's death. It reads, quote, It's impossible to communicate all of the emotions my heart has been forced to process. My wife was such a beautiful, gracious, loving woman of God. I have not only lost my ministry partner and my support, but also my very best friend. There is no way to prepare yourself for circumstances like these. As deeply as I am hurting, I'm hopeful and confident that good things will come of this. I rest in the truth of Romans 8.28 that God works all things together for the good of people who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Amanda made it her life's calling to love and serve everyone she knew. 
Even more, she has made it her life's mission to see as many people as possible come to know Jesus as their personal savior. I know that in her death and legacy, even more people will come to a saving faith in Christ. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, her desire for me would be to continue what we've started here in Indy. I hold firm to the belief that God is still good, that he takes our tragedy and turns it into triumph and that the best truly is yet to come. Some people are disturbed by the fact that he said the best is yet to come literal hours after his wife's murder. Then he started with the saying, nothing is wasted. And again, that was said just hours after her death. Then at her funeral, he kept tweeting out the hashtag, nothing is wasted. Literally, as her body is being lowered into the ground, he's trying to get a hashtag trending on Twitter. Then just days after her funeral, Davy legally registered the domain name Nothing Is Wasted and branded her tombstone with that quote. Now he has a podcast, book, website, and all different things with that name. So a lot of people question how did he have the headspace and in fact, why would he even have the headspace to start branding his wife's death literal hours after it happened. Then there's another blog post where he makes a statement about the morning that he found his wife murdered. This post is dated April 14th, 2016, so just a few months after the murder. In part, it reads, quote, On November 10th, everything changed. It was a normal Tuesday morning. I woke up at around 4.30 a.m., read my Bible for a bit, grabbed my gym clothes, and headed out for a workout. When I returned home to shower, I walked into a reality I'd never wish on anyone. My home had been broken into and Amanda was lying on the floor unconscious with three gunshot wounds, one to the head. I don't really know how anyone is expected to process a moment like that. I suppose I'll attempt to explain more one day on this blog, but for now, the only way I can describe it is everything seemed to be a slow motion blur as all my worst fears became reality. I called 911 as soon as I could and the paramedics rushed Amanda to the hospital. The next 24 hours were a waiting game to see if the swelling in her brain would subside and give us any hope of her survival. Mid-morning on November 11th, the doctors informed me that there was no brain activity and that she would not recover. I know it seems I'm writing all of this very matter-of-factly as if it doesn't carry with it a slew of emotions, quite the opposite in fact. I'll spend future posts reflecting on those first 24 hours and the days thereafter. All I can tell you now is from that moment, a countless number of people have wrapped their arms around Weston and me and have lovingly walked us through these past five months. You truly cannot go through a tragedy like this alone. A lot of people read that and feel that the way it's written sounds a bit narcissistic. The way it was written seems to be a little bit distant to some. It seems like something someone would write if they were years and years and years away from the tragedy but it is still a very fresh wound. The other thing people point to is that in his statement, he feels the need to explain why he went home after the gym. It's strange because there shouldn't be an explanation for why he came home. It's his home and he was done working out, so he came home. Some people think that this is sort of a way to anticipate a question as to why he was home, so he had a reason rather than just trying to say that he came home. If he had some sort of involvement, that would be his reason for coming home and wanting to conveniently find her. Instead, he came up with a story that he needed to be home for the shower, that he wasn't just coming home because he wanted to, that there was a reason that he was in that place at that time was because he needed to shower. Whereas normally, if you were totally innocent and you just happened to find your significant other dead on the floor, that you wouldn't really need an explanation for why you came home, just that you were there. Some also point out how he refers to his home as my home rather than our home. There is a distancing between himself and Amanda in that moment. With such a close relationship as marriage, there's a lot of us and we and basically everything. But to him, this is his home. So, does that show that he had some sort of negative feelings towards Amanda when he found her? Does that mean that he felt that it was his home and that she was just living in it? Or is it just like an innocent sort of statement that he made? Then he also mentions nothing about his unborn child in this post. He only talks about his concern for Amanda, but he does not show any concern for hoping that his unborn child will survive. 
a lot of people will criticize that, but out of everything that I am talking about with this post in specific, that is something that really stuck out to me. He didn't say, you know, the next 24 hours we're waiting to see if, you know, Amanda and our baby would survive. It was just if Amanda would survive as if he didn't even pay any attention to the unborn child that was in her womb at the time. That does stand out a lot to me. Then some people point out the fact that he wrote, I called 911 as soon as I could. Some people argue that this is persuasive language, that he is trying to convince the reader that if there was a delay in him calling 911, that it's something that he couldn't have prevented, that he called 911 as soon as he could. Some people think that it's not necessary to include that. They think that an innocent person would just mention that they called 911 without trying to persuade the reader that there may have been some justified delay. When it comes to his involvement, we sort of picked apart the different things that could point towards that in terms of, you know, him possibly being narcissistic and making these strange statements but there is a couple of other things. So next, only about a year after the murder, Davey decided to write a book about the situation called Nothing is Wasted, the thing that he branded almost immediately after her death. He said that he is writing about his pain through the tragedy and the trials and the entire process. He said that he planned to release the book after the two year anniversary date of Amanda's death. Some people just find it very suspicious that immediately after her death and literally within a year that he's already trying to profit so greatly off of his wife's murder. Then people question his story from that morning. So those who knew the family say that on a normal day, Davey actually always left for the gym at 5.30 a.m. He said himself that morning that he woke up at 4.30, but on this day, he didn't leave for the gym until 6. So why was he delayed this morning? It didn't seem like he woke up any later than he normally did. What was he doing between that time? Then the family said that his workouts are usually longer than an hour, but on this day, it was only 45 minutes. Like I said earlier, he left the house at six and left the gym by seven, so it was about an hour span of time, but that doesn't include driving time, so his workout was about 45 minutes rather than an hour. Then he sort of rushed home, only to sit on the phone in his driveway for almost an hour. People have said, I don't know if this is totally confirmed, but it was said that he got out of the car multiple times while talking on the phone and looked in the window. So some people have questioned why he needed to stay in the car for the call in the first place. Why didn't he go inside? Did he not want his wife to hear what was on this call? Or did he know that she was being murdered and he wanted to make sure that he waited enough time for them to leave or waited enough time so that she would actually be dead or waited for enough time for the other neighbors to call 911 if he knew about those robberies. Why did he wait so long in the car? Now, he claimed that he stayed on the phone in the driveway for so long because he didn't want to wake up his son or wife. But those who knew the both of them said that there's no way that Amanda and the baby would have still been asleep at 8 a.m., and Davey knew that. He knew that they would have been awake after 7 a.m. when he got home. There was no reason to think that he would have woken them up if he came in the house and was talking on the phone. I also believe that they had a two-story house, so it doesn't really make sense that he would be talking so loudly that he would wake them up. And if he was worried about that, he could have just talked a little bit quieter. So why did he stay in the car on the phone for so long? The other aspect of this case is that the family actually has a dog. They have a boxer, so a boxer, the dog breed. The family said that the driveway to the house is actually pretty short. So you would have been able to hear a dog barking from where he was in his car. If Amanda was murdered by a man who broke into their home, their dog would have been barking like crazy, just like any other dog would. Even if the intruder locked the dog in another room or something like that, it would still be barking its head off. But there's never any mention of the dog anywhere. Even the men that broke into the house, as far as I know, never mentioned the dog being inside. So was the dog let out before he left for the gym? conveniently so that, you know, the dog wouldn't alert Amanda. Why would the intruders choose a house with a dog anyways? When they broke in, you'd think that the dog would start barking and that they might either leave or maybe they did put the dog outside. But in my opinion, 
a lot of people would be deterred from a dog being inside, especially because that would alert the owner right away. Why risk going into a house with a large dog that's barking at you just to steal some things when you could easily just leave and go to a different house that doesn't have a dog? Then, like I just said, the other weird thing is that if he heard the dog barking, which according to those who knew the house and the layout, he should have heard the dog barking. How can he claim that he didn't hear it or did he just ignore the dog barking for that long while he was on the phone? Both of those situations look pretty bad for him and I don't really know how he could explain that. Then at the trial, reporters who were live tweeting the trial stated that Jalen was changing his story. Like I said, he was testifying at the trial against Larry about him being the murderer. So, when he was testifying, first he said that Larry killed Amanda to stop her from lunging at him. But in another story, he said that Larry was trying to rape her and she was fighting him off, so he murdered her. The family thinks it's strange as well that if there was such a violent altercation with him trying to rape her, that there was no DNA on her body that matched Larry. They think that the reason for the changing stories might be because they're hiding something. If they were hired to kill her, then obviously they would have to come up with some other reason for killing her. Some people even think that all of these other burglaries were sort of set up to make it look like this was just a random attack, when in reality, the entire thing was planned so that, you know, Davy would never be suspected that, you know, oh, these people burglarized all of these other houses and then ended with Amanda and murdered her. So that's clearly how this entire thing happened. But some people questioned why Amanda was the only one harmed out of all of these different people that they burglarized. Again, he is suspected of killing that other man and raping the other woman, but those are not confirmed and he was never actually convicted for those charges. So as far as we know, Amanda is the only person that he harmed while robbing them. So why her? We don't really know. Then, in yet another disturbing coincidence, just a few days before the murder, Davy did a sermon with a fake gun where he shot someone on stage multiple times. This was to illustrate shooting worries away by worshiping. He then posted it on the church's website just a few days after burying Amanda. To sing, it became a weapon. Don't worry, this is an airsoft gun. A weapon to battle worry. I thought we'd just have some fun with it. Come here, Zach. Come on. Because sometimes you just need to be reminded. Derek, come hold my microphone. You just be, need to be reminded that when you get that phone call, instead of worrying about it, step over here because I'm going to go crossways. Instead of worrying about it, maybe you need to worship. Boom. Instead of worrying about the medical bill, maybe you need to worship. Instead of, I missed right there, but it's okay if your worship misses, just go again. Maybe instead of worrying so much about your kids, you need to lift it up and surrender to Jesus in worship. Maybe instead of worrying about the job situation, you need to worship. Maybe instead of worrying about the project at school, you need to study and then worship. Maybe instead of worrying about what other people think about you, you need to worship. Come on. Now, if this was just a weird coincidence that happened days before that he had this sermon and, you know, it was just a weird coincidence that his wife was murdered just a few days after. I get that. But the fact that he still posted the video of the sermon on the website after his wife was brutally murdered by being shot three times, that is just tone deaf at best and suspicious at worst. So, some people think that Davey knew about the three men who were known to be involved in gang activity together. Investigators at one point, I believe, admitted that they thought that Davey may have known more than he was letting on about gang activity in the area because he had always claimed that he thought the area was super safe and that he never saw this coming. But investigators believe, again, this is just alleged, I'm not sure if this is absolutely confirmed, but I have seen that investigators believe that he knew a little bit more about the gang activity in the area. Some internet sleuths found three friends on Facebook that Diano and Davey actually had in common, so there was some sort of connection there. 
One of these friends was someone who Davey knew through the church, so maybe he did know Diano, and he reached out to him and his gang to shoot his wife. That is sort of the whole, like, conspiracy here, that he somehow had this connection with Diano, that he knew about the gang activity, he knew about these three people who did crimes together, and he reached out to them to hire them to kill his wife for whatever reason, and that he just downplayed how much he knew about the gang activity to sort of cover that up. But then, people have to wonder, why would he want his wife murdered? They seemed to have a wonderful relationship. Nothing seemed to be going wrong. Investigators didn't seem to find anything. Why would he want her murdered? So, one thing I haven't brought up yet is the fact that two years after the murder, Davey got remarried. He said that he made himself wait one year until after Amanda's death to date again, and that is when he met his new wife, Christy. He said that Christy had started attending his church in October of 2016. He said that months later, the two had a conversation where he found out that her stepdad actually lives near the home that he used to share with Amanda, but also that her stepdad is one of the prison chaplains who regularly spoke with the men that killed Amanda. He said that from there, he knew that God placed Christy in his life for a reason, and that is when they began a relationship. They went on to get married, and I believe they now have a daughter together. However, there have been some people who have worked together to sort of put information together to see if there really is anything to Davey wanting to murder his wife. So, during one of the posts made to the Resonant Church website, Davey and Amanda talk about the struggles in their relationship. They talk about certain aspects of their dysfunctional relationship and Davey's sex drive. He said in this video that the two of them fight pretty often and he said things like he makes Amanda have sex with him before dinner so that his sex drive doesn't get in the way of him concentrating on dinner conversations. Others posted to a blog that Amanda confided in other members of her church group that Davey was actually physically abusive towards her, that he humiliated her and was physically and verbally abusive towards her. Then some people found connections between Christy and Davey before Amanda's death. So I'm not blaming him for getting married two years after the death, even dating a year after it. Everybody has their own amount of time to grieve, but it did turn out that both Christy and Davey went to the same LA Fitness at the same time actually for several years before the murder. So some have speculated that they actually knew each other before he claims they met at the church. So the reasons here could be one, that he got this huge insurance benefit. Two, that he no longer wanted to be with Amanda, but he is a very, very religious person who is also a pastor and he knew that if he got divorced, it would be very heavily frowned upon by those he preaches to. That could be a career ender for him. Then if he met Christy and fell for her, but obviously couldn't cheat on his wife, he might have killed her instead so that he could eventually end up with Christy. So those are the three possible motives here. I don't know how much investigators actually looked into him. I can't honestly say if there was evidence or not to prove any of this. This is all just speculation that I gathered from different blog posts and postings from those who knew Amanda and Davey, and also just other weird things that I was able to find through his own posts, his own words, and things like that. Something else that is very, very strange and concerning about Davey is that all throughout this entire thing, he says things like, I wouldn't trade what happened for the world, which to me is really messed up. Like you wouldn't trade your wife being brutally murdered and possibly raped. There are a lot of people who would have traded a lot for that to have never happened. He has tried really, really hard to turn this tragedy into a positive thing that could enact change, but for some people, that has just gone way too far. I think the fact that he acted so very quickly to capitalize off of his wife's death is very concerning. The fact that he's always saying that this is a positive thing in his life, that it, you know, makes positive change, that she was just someone who God chose to sacrifice her life for the better of others. I think all of that is really strange and I think a mourning husband wouldn't say things like that. They would be angry. I'm not saying that they wouldn't try to find reason in all of this. They probably absolutely would. 
but the fact that he so very quickly after her murder just turned it into something he could make money off of, to me, that is very, very concerning. To me, someone who is guilty, someone who wants to make others more convinced that her death was for something, that it was for the greater good or something like that. Someone who's trying to convince everybody else of that, in my opinion, is trying to feel better about themselves. And that's just me. But I think that if, like, if I did something horrible like that and I really wanted other people to think like it was these men, I forgive them. They did a horrible thing, but Amanda's death brought better things to the world. It brought better change. I would want people to believe that because then if I really did come out to be me, maybe people wouldn't be so harsh on me. That's just what I think. So that is all the information that I have, but there is a lot more out there. I did try my best to only include information that I at least found relatively credible, but again, a lot of it is just speculation. I try to be empathetic towards how people react in a traumatic situation. So when someone says, oh, they didn't cry enough, they didn't seem like sad enough, they were stoic, they, you know, were hysterical, they weren't hysterical enough, I try not to judge people based off of those behaviors because everybody, everybody reacts differently to trauma no matter who you are. Everybody's different. So I try not to put too much weight into that when I'm sort of deciding if I think someone could be involved. I personally think that with this case, it is possible that Davy had some sort of involvement. I do think that there are a lot of strange things about that morning parts of the story that just don't make sense and parts of his behavior that are really concerning. But I do also think it's possible that Davey is a narcissist. Now that may be harsh and I don't throw around that word. I know a lot of people will throw around the word narcissist. I personally do not. But I think it is fitting for this situation. No matter how good of a person you are or how strong your faith is, the way he acted in the days and even the hours after his wife is murdered is a little bit appalling. Even if he didn't have any involvement, I think that this happened and he immediately saw it as something that happened to him. Something that people could look at him and feel sorry for him for. Something that he could use for his teachings. I think that in his head, it switched from something that was traumatic that he was going through that happened to the love of his life to something that he could benefit from really quick, disturbingly quick. The fact that he branded his wife's grave with his new business is honestly kind of sickening to me. It shows a lot of those aspects of just being a narcissist and trying to make things and turn it into your own story. I know that there isn't a lot of evidence. There's pretty much no concrete evidence to say that he was involved in any way. He absolutely could just be the victim of losing his spouse to a horrible, horrible tragedy. But his behaviors will never not give me the ick. And I think that there is a reasonable suspicion here. The one thing that really stands out to me, though, about this entire thing, whether Davey is involved, whether I think he's involved, is the fact that three men went to jail for this. And I don't think any of them had ever brought up knowing Davey. A huge part in this whole, you know, Davy contacting Diano and getting the three of them to kill Amanda thing was because the three of them were basically best friends. They saw each other as family. So they did this together. I feel like they would have turned on Davy much quicker than Diano and Jalen would have turned on Larry if they truly were hired to kill Amanda. Unless they weren't all in on it, but I still have a feeling like someone would have said something. If I was hired to kill someone and I got caught and I saw the person who hired me living his best life, making a bunch of money, getting remarried, all of that, I'd say something. But that might just be just me. But, you know, maybe someday these men will say something too if they truly were hired for this. But to me, I just feel like at some point they would have had their own best interest in mind. So if they really were hired for this, I feel like they would have said anything to get a shorter sentence and they would have put the blame on Davey very quickly. I don't think three men would have gone to jail pretty much almost for life. Even the two that were just convicted of burglary, they most likely won't get out of jail until they're 50s. So personally, I wouldn't go to jail for that long without spilling the tea on who else was involved. I wouldn't go to jail for somebody else, even if I was a terrible person who murdered people. I wouldn't go to jail for someone else. 
I would let it know immediately that I got caught, but this person is also involved. I would want them to go down with me. So the fact that they've never mentioned knowing Davey or him being a part of any of this, that's a pretty big factor for the side of like Davey was not involved, but that's just me. Either way, that is all of the information that I have for today's video. Davey is still very active on his blog. He has a lot of posts about the situation and his life since. So if you're interested in reading those, his website will be linked down below. I read a couple of them. They're very long and some of them, again, are just a little bit tone deaf in my opinion, but Either way, there are a lot of other Facebook groups for discussing this case at greater lengths, a lot of blog posts about different things that are suspicious, about people sort of breaking down Davy's statements and looking for basically problems or things to be suspicious about in things that he's said. So again, those will be listed down below if you want to read them. But I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of your guys' thoughts are on this case. Do you think that Davey was involved? If so, why? Or do you think this truly was just a random act of violence and Amanda was unfortunately the victim of it? Let me know this and any other thoughts and theories you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!